Well, good morning and welcome to Calvary Church. My name is Dave Ross. We are so excited to worship with you today, whether you're in the room or joining us online. If you're in the room, let's stand together so we can sing to our King. Arise, my soul, remember this, he took my sin and he buried it, no longer I who live, now Jesus lives in me. gather together to worship our God. We, we love to begin with songs that proclaim who Jesus is and the work he's done for us and the testimony we have in that. That's what we just sang about. And so we give glory to God. We also like to sing songs to proclaim who God is. Whether it's a new song or it's an old song, we want to we wanna sing together about God and, and his character. And so this next song we're going to sing is an older song, but it, the first line is taken directly from Scripture, and so I want to read that. That's from 1 Timothy. It says, Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's sing those words together now as we continue to worship our God. Blessed Lord. 
Thanks for singing. You may be seated. Hello, Calvary Church. My name's Liz Rodriguez, and whether you're joining us in person, online, or by radio, we're so glad that you've joined us today. During your time with us, we want you to feel connected. So whether this is your first time joining us or you've been here for a while, if you have questions or would like to take your next steps here at Calvary, we're here for you. The first way to get connected is simply to scan the QR code that's on the screen and fill out our digital connect card. You can also stop by the overlook in the middle of our lobby immediately following the service where a few of our staff and volunteers will be available to chat with you. We also have our care team available at the front of the auditorium at the end of the service. They're here to pray with you for any specific need that you may have. And if you're tuning in live on our website, there's a host available and willing to connect and pray with you. All you simply have to do is ask. There's also another opportunity for you to learn more about Calvary coming up on Sunday, July 17th at 1230. We'll be hosting Discover Calvary. There you'll hear from Pastor Bo about who we are, where we're going and how it all fits together. Lunch will be provided, so make sure to let us know that you're coming. Today is the first Sunday of July, and with the new month comes new events. In the coming weeks, we'll be hosting a membership class, holding another Global Ministries Ice Cream Social, hosting a one-day women's Bible study, and so much more. Make sure to check out your bulletin or Life at Calvary for more info. And if you're not receiving Life at Calvary in your email inbox every Tuesday, make sure to sign up at calvarychurch.org slash life so you're staying in the loop with everything happening here at Calvary. Now let's turn our attention back to worship as we continue to lift our God high and glorify his name. Well, as Liz said, we continue in worship. And as we do that today, we're going to be continuing in our series uh, entitled Life of David. And we are privileged to have a speaker with us today by the name of Dr. John Soden. He's no stranger to many of us. He is a former elder. He teaches in ABF class, and he is a professor of Bible and theology at Lancaster Bible College and is finishing up a commentary on the book of Genesis. And we always love when he opens the word of God for us, and so we're looking forward to hearing from him today. Well, tomorrow we celebrate the birth of our nation. We will celebrate today even, as many of us will go and see fireworks and spend time with family. But we celebrate the fact that 246 years ago, our founding fathers boldly created a republic that was meant to have leaders that represented the people, not ruled over the people. A government that protected our freedom, not bestowed freedom upon us. And so as we think on that and we remember that, we want to all be living our lives in gratitude and celebrating that reality together because that is what allows us to be here today and to worship together. And even as we join together in united gratitude for that, we also know that our country is divided like never before. 
and even our churches are divided. But I'm reminded that we are first and foremost citizens of the kingdom of God when we follow and believe in Jesus Christ. And so that is what our citizenship priority is. And we want to be um, proud citizens of this country, and we also want to be realizing that we are representatives of the Most High God. And we want to live our lives in pursuit of that, keeping the gospel as our focus. And so with that in mind, I want to pray for us now as we continue on. Lord, you are the only immortal, wise, and most high God, as we just sang. We proclaim that first and foremost, recognizing our mortality in the here and now. But we rejoice that you are the giver of life. You have redeemed us and promised everlasting life through your son, Jesus. It is because of his work that we may have new life. We thank you, Lord, for the blessing of living in this nation. Even as we are thankful, we pray for our country. We pray for our leaders, recognizing that you are sovereign over all. You ask us to honor and respect those in governing authority. We are proud citizens of this United States of America, but more importantly, we are ambassadors of the Most High God living a life that pursues you. Your word tells us in Psalm 139 that you knit us together even in our mother's womb. Jesus, give us the courage and the compassion we need to live as faithful advocates for human life. Today, we especially think about the lives of unborn children, not only in this country, but all over the world. Give us sufficient grace and the courage we need to champion for those precious lives. We thank you for the decision of the Supreme Court that gives authority back to the states in this area. We pray for the leaders of each state now that they would enact laws that value life, even for those yet unborn. And Jesus, equip us to love and to care for women and men whose stories have been marked by abortion. May your all-sufficient gospel bring healing and compassion to each and every one of those stories. And Father, we thank you for those who provide a safe family for children who are in need, for those who foster children, and for those who have and are adopting. Most of all, Lord, we praise you for your good news the gospel that you died for our sins and rose again to defeat sin and death. It is your grace in our lives. And this grace demands that we treat others with mercy, even if we disagree. We should speak truth in love, not in disdain. We pray for our world that desperately needs you, Jesus. We lift up the less fortunate, the brokenhearted, the abused, and the marginalized among us, May we shine your love and care for them. May we be a shining light of what it means to follow you, to display that our hope is built on you and you alone, Jesus. You truly are the only solid rock. All other ground is sinking sand, as the song says. Thank you for that truth. Thank you that we can put our hope in you. It's in your name we ask and pray for these things. Amen. Let's stand together and let's sing to the one who we put our hope in.
that chorus one more time, just our voices. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all underground is sinking sand, all underground is sinking sand. Christ count on one thing the same God that never fails will not fail me now you won't fail me now in the waiting the same God who's never late is working all things out you're working all things out yes I will lift you high in the lowest valley, yes, I will bless your name.
Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we get to come in celebration and worship and praise of you, but also in the humility of knowing that you are our King and our Father in heaven. Thank you that you are a firm foundation on which we can stand and base our entire lives upon because they are yours. Thank you for being a consistent and holy Father, and I ask that you help us to focus on that today um, during this message. In your name we pray, amen. Kids are dismissed for Kids Church, and you may have a seat. Well, good morning. My name is John Soden, and I have the privilege of sharing with you today from the life of David. What a privilege. Great stories, uh, just well-told, exciting, encouraging, but the best thing about them is they're not designed just to give us excitement. They're designed to teach us about God and about how we need to respond to him. And that's what I look forward to today, that's what I look forward to in the life of David, and that's what we find in what we will be looking at this morning. As we think about what God is doing, as we think about his working, we recognize that it's not always pretty in our world. I don't know about you, but at least that's my world. In fact, oftentimes it's really hard, it's really challenging, and we have the responsibility of deciding what to do, making choices. How do I live? How do I respond? And that's really what I want to think about as we talk about David, as we think about what's going on. And as I was thinking about this, as I was thinking about the tensions between David and Saul and this whole thing about how long it took for David to become king, it's kind of crazy. I actually was thinking about my high school senior year. Um, <clears throat> my high school senior year was kind of weird because I was in a new school. I wasn't... Uh, it wasn't where I'd grown up at all. I didn't know anybody. I actually had one professor, one teacher that actually thought I was a freshman. That didn't go real good, but that's the way it was. <clears throat> um, but in your senior year, you're supposed to do things like vote for different things for high school yearbook. I didn't know anybody. Nobody knew me. I don't even know if I had a yearbook. But we do things like, and I don't know who actually comes up with these ideas, but why would you vote in your senior year for who is most likely to win the lottery and lose the lottery ticket? Or who is most likely to get ID'd when they're 30? That'd probably be me. Who is the most likely to have a child born addicted to Starbucks? Hmm. <clears throat> well, actually the thing I was thinking about was who is most likely to, much more mundane, succeed, right? And when we think about that, how do you know in the, as a senior in high school who's going to succeed? In fact, what is success? How do we define success and how do we guarantee success? How do we reach that? What does that mean? So I wanted to think about that a little bit because I honestly think that is where we're going with the life of David. And the thing that David and his life drives us to is to see some of the ways God is preparing David to succeed. And I'd like to define success because success in our world is often my bank account, my job title, the, the likes or the followers I have on social media. I don't know. What is it that makes success in your world? Is it the thing you drive or the thing you live in? Or what is it? Well, actually, none of that 
define success, does it? And we know that because as I'm thinking about success, I'm thinking about really thriving in life. So I'm going to define success this way. We only ultimately thrive when we bow in dependent submission, enjoying relationship with our sovereign king in faith. Thriving in life has to come in relationship to my, my God. Thriving in life does not come just merely in relationship to my world. And I have to be recognizing that, but that really is where David is going as well. So as we come back to the story of David and we think about David, we're not going to be in exactly the same situation as David. We're not, wrong button, we're not going to be looking at life from his standpoint simply because he's going to be king. Uh, that's not me. He has somebody actively trying to kill him. A pathological killer is after him. That's not me either. However, we all have stresses. Some of us are in very difficult, very painful times of life. Some of us, maybe not so much now, but this really speaks to all of us. And I'd like to think through both what he's going through and how God is using that, as well as how he is responding to it and how we need to see our perspective and our responses to our world as well. So join me. Um, I'd like to start with a backstory. So thinking a little bit in terms of David's life, David was anointed king in chapter 16 of Samuel as a, uh, as a young man. How old he was, don't know for sure. I'd guess he was probably a late teenager, but I don't really know. He's anointed king, and he's supposed to be king, but one little bitty problem. It's going to be years before he's king. In fact, it's going to be a very painful set of years. Imme immediately, or immediately in the story, initially, we see him being drafted into the service of the king, Saul. And he comes into Saul's kingship, uh, into his service, at the end of chapter 16, and he's helping Saul out, um, but there's a bit of a problem even with serving the king because as the king gets to know him better, the king doesn't like him so much. I don't know how you are, but when you're close to somebody that doesn't really care for you, it's not necessarily fun. I'm not just talking about uh, a little distaste. I'm talking about actively trying to kill him, right? We already saw that. So throughout these years, throughout these chapters as we see them in Samuel, David is having to dodge spears. David is having to dodge Samuel, or Saul's henchmen. David is having to dodge enemies, the Philistines. And finally, David decided to get out of Dodge. So as he is running from Saul, you would think things are getting better. But while David is, has his life threatened in Saul's presence, Saul continues to pursue him. Ten times, try, at least ten times, Saul tried to kill him in his presence. Five more times we have recorded in Scripture where Saul is trying to kill him as David is trying to keep his head down, running away, hiding in the desert. And David is facing tremendous pressure. I'd like to look today at the last encounter between David and Saul. That's uh, 1 Samuel chapter 26. And if you would turn with me in your Bibles or in your devices to 1 Samuel chapter 26. If, the, if you use the Pew Bible in front of you, it's page 249. I'd like to read the chapter for us. <clears throat> I'm going to read it more like I might read it when our kids were young going to bed, though. There's going to be a few interruptions, so don't let that throw you off. <clears throat> uh, those are not the words of Scripture, just in case you're curious. But. <clears throat> All right, so Saul, 1 Samuel chapter 26. Then the Ziphites came to Saul at Gibeah, saying, Is not David hiding himself on the hill of Hakalah, which is on the east of Yeshimon? So Saul arose and went down to the wilderness of Ziph with 3,000 chosen men of Israel to seek David in the wilderness of Ziph. And I don't think he was planning a party for him. And Saul encamped on the hill of Hakalah, which is beside the road in the east of Yeshimon. But David remained in the wilderness. When he saw Saul had come after him in the wilderness, David sent out spies and learned that Saul had come. Then David rose and went to the place where Saul had encamped. And David saw the place where Saul lay with Abner, son of Ner, the commander of his army. Saul was lying within the encampment while the army was encamped around him. Then David said to Himelech the Hittite and to Joab's brother Abishai the son of Zerui, who will go down with me into the camp to Saul? Abishai said, I'll go down with you. Now, hold on just a second. Who's this Abishai guy? Who volunteers to walk into 3,000 enemy soldiers trying to kill you? That doesn't really make sense, right? In fact, it doesn't make sense for David. Well, this Abishai guy, if you go to the end of 2 Samuel, the last few chapters, 
there's a couple of different places where the writer tells us about some of the mighty men of David. These are his, uh, these are his arrangers. These are his elite light infantry that can do anything. They're the ones who have the, the great exploits in battle. He had 30 particular ones who were the best. Abishai is the captain of the 30. He's the commander of the 30. He is the best of the best. He's the number one ranger. And he, you can just imagine him saying, David, I got your back. Let's go. 3,000, no big deal. We can deal with it, right? So that's the guy he's got. So David and Abishai went with the army by night, went to the army. And there lay Saul sleeping within the encampment with his spear stuck in the ground at his head. And Abner and the army lay around him. Then Abishai said to David, God has given your enemy into your hand this day. Now please, let me pin him to the earth with one stroke of the spear and I won't strike twice. But David said to Abishai, do not destroy him, for who can put out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? Now wait a minute. <clears throat> this doesn't make any sense. David, why would he not go in to kill Saul? Isn't that what he's there for? I mean, Saul is trying to kill him. Why wouldn't David be trying to kill Saul? And he gets all the way up, and there he is. But that's not his plan. Interesting. All right, back to the story. David said, <clears throat> As the Lord lives, the Lord will strike him or his day will come to die or he'll go down to battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should put out my hand against the Lord's anointed. But take now the spear that at his head, the jar of water, and let's go. So David took the spear and the jar of water from Saul's head and they went away. No man saw it or knew it, nor did any awake, for they were all asleep because a deep sleep from the Lord had fallen on them. I knew it. In fact, David must be wrong, Right? Because God is the one who got him there. God must be the one who has given him to him. God must have wanted him to kill him. Right? Maybe not. Let's try it. So David went over to the other side and stood far off on the top of the hill with a great space between them. And David called to the army and to Abner, son of Ner, saying, Will you not answer, Abner? Then Abner answered, Who are you who calls to the king? David said to Abner, Are you not a man? Who's like you in Israel? Why then have you not kept watch over your lord, the king? For one of the people came to destroy the king, your lord. This thing you've done is not good. As the lord lives, you deserve to die because you have not kept watch over your lord, the lord's anointed. Now see where the king's spear is and the jar of water that said he's head. Was he surprised or what? Saul recognized David's voice and said, Is this your voice, my son David? David said, It is my voice, my lord, O king. He said, why does my Lord pursue after his servant? For what have I done? What evil is in my hands? Now, therefore, let my Lord the king hear the words of his servant. If it is the Lord who has stirred you up against me, may he accept an offering. But we all know it's not the Lord. But if it is men, may they be cursed before the Lord, for they have driven me out this day, that I should have no share in the heritage of the Lord, saying, go serve other gods. We know it's not other men, it's Saul. Now, therefore, let not my blood fall to the earth away from the presence of the Lord. For the king of Israel has come out to seek a single flea, like one who hunts a partridge in the mountains. Then Saul said, I have sinned. Return, my son David, I will no more harm you, because my life was precious in your eyes this day. Behold, I've acted foolishly, and I've made a great mistake. David answered and said, Here is your spear, O king. Let one of the young men come over and take it. No way David is going back over there. <clears throat> the, <clears throat> the Lord rewards every man for his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord gave you into my hand today, and I would not put out my hand against the Lord's anointed. Behold, as your life was precious this day in my sight, so may my life be precious in the sight of the Lord, and may he deliver me out of all tribulation. Then, David, then Saul said to David, Blessed be you, my son David. You will do many things and will succeed in them. So David went his way, and Saul returned to his place. God is testing David. David is facing a deep threat, and he's under an intense pressure. How does he respond? Well, I would say he responds really well. But there's a problem, and part of the problem is what we face every day, and that is that there's a really fine line between testing and temptation, right? When I face testing is also when I'm tempted because 
really that's kind of what testing does. It reveals what's inside. It's kind of like hot water. It shows what's in the tea bag, right? So what comes out? And for me, that can be very tempting as to how I respond. So I would like to walk through some of these temptations that I see or the, the tests that we see for David. And then I want to go back and walk through David's response to them and see why he responds the way he does and what it is that perhaps David is thinking or working with as he's working in this story, as he's thinking through what's happening in his life. So the first thing that I think of is, well, probably really obvious. I don't know about you, but sneaking through 3,000 men to get up to some guy in the middle of the night without anybody waking up and nobody noticing, and by the way, where were the guards anyway? Well, as the narrator tells us, God is the one who did it, and when God does it, and when you know that it's a clear opportunity, don't you often think, this is God's will? You see, opportunity from us often looks like an open door. And I often pray, Lord, if this is your will, Make the door open. The problem is, an open door or opportunity is not a guarantee of God's will. We know that, right? I mean, that's obvious. There's lots of things I have lots of opportunity for, but I know for sure it's not God's will. So that doesn't necessarily mean that I should be doing it. Add to that, however, he's got a friend with him. And what's the friend doing? You can do it. This is it. Go for it. This is God's will. Peer pressure. That peer pressure is uh, even probably more significant than we think. And here's the reason. Uh, in, the, in the narrative that we have up to this point, and I'd really encourage you to go back and read some of this, maybe this afternoon or the rest of the week sometime or other, but the stories leading up to chapter 26 relate other incidences, and one of them is very similar to this story. So chapter 24 tells us when David was hiding in a cave, and he and his men were in the cave trying to keep out of Saul's sight. Saul doesn't know he's there, but Saul happens to stop by and use the cave to relieve himself, and the men are telling David, this is it. Kill him. Take him out. And again, David refuses. Now, you may remember the story, but David actually sneaks up, cuts off a piece of the hem of Saul's, of Saul's robe, which was probably a pretty significant statement of derision and, and challenging the rule of Saul, but... David refuses to kill him, and even his conscience strikes him about taking the piece of his hem. But I want you to see the words that the, that the men use. What do they say? The men of David said to David, to him, Here is the day of which the Lord has said to you, Behold, I will give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it shall seem good to you. In other words, God has promised it. This is the answer. Kill him. For some reason, David doesn't see it that way. And I'd like to suggest to you, now we don't have any idea if and when God said this. He may have, but David is saying that's not what he meant. Or maybe this was a false prophecy, or maybe they're making it up. We don't really know. But what we do know is David doesn't see this as genuinely God's will, and I think there's some good reasons for it. But I'd like to come back to that. What I want to see here, however, is that even if God has said it, there are times when what we want to do colors our perspective on how we read what God has said. And we can rationalize easily to make God's word say what I want it to say. I would call that deceptive voices. That what David is facing is not only peer pressure and opportunity, but he's, he is facing some deception, some spin as to how he needs to respond to this. But there's even more. David is saying, I'm not going to reach out my hand against the Lord's anointed, but he is the Lord's anointed. He has the promise of God. The kingship is for him. Isn't it up to him to simply take it? And David is saying no. Why? Those are the questions we need to think through. I mean, it's been a long time. And I don't know about you, but of my better qualities... I think I have some. Patience is not one of them. It's really easy to get impatient, isn't it? It's very easy to say, wait a minute, I've been waiting for this for years. It should be mine. I might as well do it. I might as well take it. It's how I think God is just waiting for me to act. David says, no, I will wait. 
But there's more than that. Very next verse. First verse of chapter 27. David breaks down and he says, one of these days Saul is going to get me. I'm out of here. He is facing what I don't expect at this point. Fear. When he walks into a, an army of 3,000 to face Saul, you're not thinking, oh, he's afraid. You're thinking, the guy's crazy. He must not know any fear. I mean, what is going on with this guy? And yet, he is. He recognizes the danger. In fact, he's already said it here in this chapter. What does he say? He said, verse 20, Now therefore let not my blood fall to the earth away from the presence of the Lord. He realizes how tenuous his life is. He is on thin ice, hanging by a thread, whatever other metaphor you want to use. He's close, right? He is afraid. In fact, if you back up a verse, I think there's even more going on. Verse 19. He recognizes, he says, If it is men, may they be accursed before the Lord, for they have driven me out this day, that I shall have no share in the heritage of the Lord, saying, Go serve other gods. There is a temptation, there is a push for him to say, God hasn't come through, let me go follow other gods that will maybe give me what I want. And he feels as if Saul, by pushing him away, is actually saying, you have no part in Yahweh anyway. There is a spiritual sense of desperation as well. He's not only physically endangered, he's spiritually endangered. And David is saying, this isn't it. There's something else going on. So what I need to do and what I want to see as we look at this story is I want to think a little bit about how David is responding and why he doesn't see these things, these temptations, as driving him away from God fully. In other words, he's willing to say, God, I choose to follow you. Not just because he has opportunity or peer pressure or, or deceptive voices or promise or any of the rest of this. We want to take a look at David's heart. So let's go back to his response to Abishai. There's a lot of things going on there, but I'd like to just look at a few of those. When David responds to Abishai, Abishai says, let me take him out. I can do it once, once, one stroke and he's dead. David says, no. Do not destroy him, for who can put out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? Now that is not just a warning to Abishai. It is, but it's more. There's two other things going on there. One of them is for David himself, because David cannot put his hand at God against the Lord's anointed. That's what he says at the end. And Saul is trying to kill David, who is also the Lord's anointed. All of this is playing in here. But we also need to see that it was God's anointing. Let me put it a different way. God is the one who established the king. God is the one who choos cho chooses the king for Israel. That's the anointing. Dumps oil on his head. The man of God comes, dumps oil on the king's head, and that means this is the king. This is the guy God chooses. When he does, that is God's appointment, and God is the one who can change it, no one else. And what David is saying is, this is God's choice. And it's only God's to make. God put him in the position. Only God can take him out of the position. Now, David is actually responding to what I think is clearly already commanded in Scripture from David's perspective. Because in Exodus chapter 22, <clears throat> we see this statement. You shall not revile God, nor curse a ruler of your people. Notice how they fit together. These are working together, not separately. These aren't two separate commands, but it's really two parts of the same command. Because if you do not revile God, you will not curse his ruler because the ruler is the representative of God. God has chosen him, and so he is the one who is, has God's authority. To revile or to curse a ruler is to revile God. I can't imagine much more of a curse than trying to stick a spear through him. And David says, no. No. This is God's choice to make. And God has already set the standard. He's already stated what it is. When I'm making a choice and I'm tempted, how well do I know what God has already said? That's the question, I think, that we have to ask with David. But there's more. So, back to our statement here. 
David said to Abishai, don't destroy him, for who can put out his hand against the Lord's anointed? Um, brings up in David's mind, Abishai's mind, and it should bring up in our mind something that had just previously happened not too long before. And that's the story I already told you about. David in the cave. After David chooses not to take out Saul and says, nope, I can't stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed, Saul leaves the cave. David follows him out of the cave and says, hey, Saul, by the way, I could have killed you, but I didn't. In fact, three times, David says to Saul, I will not kill you. I will not put out my hand against the Lord's anointed. David has already promised this. And at the end of that story, David says, actually Saul says to David, swear to me that you not only won't kill me, but that you won't kill my descendants because when David becomes king, that's what kings do, right? Take out all the opposition. David swore to Saul, he not only wouldn't kill Saul, but he wouldn't kill Saul's descendants. So this is reminding David not only of the false words, but it's also reminding David of his previous promise. And David is recognizing his responsibility. He's already made the decision. Now, making a decision does not remove temptation. We know that, right? Just because I decide I'm not going to do that anymore doesn't mean I won't do it anymore, nor does it mean I won't be tempted to do it anymore. Just because I decide I'm not going to do that thing doesn't mean I won't face that pressure again to do it. But he's already made the decision and he sticks to it. But there's another story that's very helpful here in thinking about this story. And that's the one just before this. So chapter 24 is David in the cave, David and Saul in the cave. Chapter 26 is David and Saul in the field. Right in between them, chapter 25, is a guy by the name of Nabal. And uh, Nabal has lots of stuff and he's got sheep, uh, sheep all over the place and he's got the, the herders are out there taking care of him. And David is protecting them all. And when sheep shearing comes time, time comes and Nabal is, is reaping the benefits of all of his work, David says, hey, you know what? I've played a big role in your success. Would you like to help us out a little bit here? And Nabal totally dismisses him. David is so angry, he's going to come and destroy Nabal and his men. Nabal's wife, Abigail, intervenes. And she gets to David first, gives him a gift, and basically says, don't do something you're going to regret later. Because of that, David actually blesses her and says this. This is chapter 25. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel who sent you this day to meet me. Blessed be your discretion. Blessed be you who have kept me this day from blood guilt and from avenging myself with my own hand. And he recognized that God had intervened because vengeance is not his, it's God's. Even with Nabal and even with Saul. That story sets up David's mindset for the field when he recognizes it's not his to take. It's, he doesn't have the responsibility. He doesn't have the authority. He doesn't have the right to take Saul's life and to take the kingship. Vengeance belongs to God alone. But God has already said that as well. Deuteronomy 32, 35. It's where Paul gets it when he quotes this in chapter 12 of Romans. Vengeance is mine, I'll repay, says the Lord. David is responding consistently with what God has said and learning to trust God, isn't he? This is an issue of faith. I'd like to go back to one other passage that we have here. So this is a little bit later in the story when David is responding to Saul, but this is what David says. The Lord rewards every man for his righteousness and his faithfulness, for the Lord gave you into my hand today, and I would not put out my hand against the Lord's anointed. What's he saying? I'm going to have to trust God, not only to take care of me, but to reward me for doing the right thing. Does what I do matter? Yes. Very much so. What does David say? Behold, as your life was precious this day in my sight, so may my life be precious in your sight. No, that's not what he said. He's not trusting Saul. What does he say? As, my, as your life was precious in this day in my sight, so may my life be precious in the sight of the Lord. And may he deliver me out of all tribulation. God is the judge. David is trusting God for his Life and for his future, faith. 
bottom line, do I realize who God is? Do I recognize that he is the one who will judge for every man's righteousness? He will judge for every man's faithfulness and he will provide. Do I trust him? Do I see God as king and am I living loyally before him? So what? Do I really believe that God will do this? He'll reward my obedience? Do I really believe that God will reward my disobedience, bringing judgment? There's consequences for my sin? Do I really understand the realities of what this life is all about and that this is not all there is? That thriving is life is not just the way I feel at the moment, but it is my walk with God over time. And God wants me to see his life. By the way, we fail, don't we? Surprise, not to me, we all do. What do we do when we fail? We come back to God in repentance. God offers forgiveness. It's not just, oh, he's, he messed up, smack. Yeah, God brings discipline, but God also brings us back in grace in Christ. It's amazing how many times God offers us opportunity after opportunity. So, if I do really believe this, how does it show? Does it show in true obedience? In submitting to God? As we think about these things, what challenges us the most? And what encourages us the most? What do we need to hear from the Lord? How do I see my life? Am I willing to wait? I don't know what you're facing. Uh, to be honest, you don't know what I'm facing either. How can we navigate what's in front of us? For some of you, you're facing very, very difficult things. Others, maybe you're in a time of, of relative ease. For all of us, we have to consistently make those choices and say, who am I going to trust? Am I going to follow God? Am I going to bow before him? I'm gonna, am I going to submit loyally to him as my king to experience his life? Whatever I am facing now is not a surprise to the Lord. I may have many temptations because we're all being tested. But God calls us to humble submission to him. I will thrive in life only when I bow in submission and loyalty, enjoying relationship with my eternal king by faith. That relationship is through faith in Jesus. We have the privilege, we have the opportunity to come to God by faith in Christ. But it's not just for an eternal security. It is that, but it's far more than that. My life today can thrive. God calls us to a daily walk with him to enjoy the goodness of God here in spite of the pressures that I face. He's with us through those trials, through those painful difficulties. But God gives us hope and life beginning now that I can thrive. Provided for us illustrations, provided for us illustrations and examples of those who have navigated it well and those who haven't and the outcomes for each. But Lord, we also ask that as we see these things, we would be encouraged, we would be challenged and that we would bow before you, acknowledging your work in our life, your rule overall, and your <clears throat> goodness to be praised, to be honored with our lives. And Father, we commit ourselves to you. We pray for grace and strength, and we ask that you would be honored in it. Because of Jesus, because of his life, death, and resurrection for us. Amen. Please rise with me as we are reminded and as we proclaim that it is only him, not yet not I, but Christ in me. I
righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to Him. Oh, how strange. is established and it shall never be moved he will judge the peoples with equity let the heavens be glad let the earth rejoice let the sea roar and all that fills it let the field exult in everything in it then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord for he comes for he comes to judge the earth he will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness yet not I but Christ in me have a great week in the Lord